Okay, so um, in any case, uh, we're, today we're going to finish up uh, our use of the Boston summation formula um, to get information about the heat kernel on the circle, right? So remember the setting, um, we have the setting of the Boston summation formula. If you have something in the short class, you create the periodization of that function, right? You take for each x, um, you take the function and you sum it at all, right? For every x, you sum it over all x plus an integer, right? You take the values of the function at, at every, um, you know, x plus k, x plus n, where n is an integer, and that turns into a one, that creates a one periodic, uh, a continuous one periodic function called a periodization, right? Um, and the Poisson summation formula says that, well, actually this is related to the um, Fourier inversion formula um, in the sense that if you take sort of a dis dis discrete version of the, um, of the Fourier uh, inversion formula, and you, uh, you don't take an, an integral, but you take some sort of only, the, uh, only at the integer values, and you sum those values, you actually get the periodization also. So this is the this is the, the uh, celebrated Poisson summation formula, and we said we're going to use it on um, on the heat kernel um, for the circle to get uh, to, to show that the heat kernel on the circle is is an approximation of identity. So just to recall for, for those of you who um, uh, you know maybe have forgotten, um, we have this thing uh, h uh, plain h plain capital H. Uh, the heat kernel on the circle, n is in the integers, e to the negative 4 pi squared, n squared t, e to the 2 pi pi and x. We also have fancy, uh, fancy h, t, the heat, uh, heat kernel on the line, which is this guy, 1 over uh, 4 pi t to the half, uh, e to the negative x squared over 4 pi. And this is the one which we had a lot of information about. We knew that this one was an approximation of identity. Um, this is the one um, which we were, uh, were, uh, were not able to show as an approximation of identity. But we're going to do it today by, by using Poisson, uh, Poisson summation. Um, right, so last time uh, we showed, last time, uh, by the Poisson summation, we saw that, in fact, the, uh, the heat kernel on the line was the periodization of the heat kernel on the, on the I'm sorry, the heat kernel on the circle, excuse me, was the periodization of the heat kernel on the line. Right? So you take the heat kernel on the line, you, you periodize it, and you get the heat kernel on the circle. Okay. Um, and uh, the, the corollary that we're going for it is to show that um, that the heat kernel on the circle um, is an approximation of identity. Right, so um, it's easy to see that if we 
So this is a one periodic function. Here's a period we're going to integrate over a full period. Right? It's easy to see that, that this is one. Um, you just uh, use the uniform convergence. Right? You're integrating over something of length like one this time right? against dx. Right? Well, each of these guys, you can, because of the uniform convergence, you can switch the order. Right? So you can pull out the pull out the integral. Pull out the integral, right? because you get summation integral. Um, integral, so n over z, g omega 4 pi squared x squared t, integral. But these guys are, are periodic functions on this period, right? So you're going to get zero for everybody except when n is equal to zero, right? The only thing, the only, the only term that's going to come out of this is the n equals zero term. So you get e to the zero, and then one, <laughs> and the integral of one. So you get one, the n. Okay, so just just by just because this is a uniformly convergent, this is a uniformly convergent series, you can switch the order of integration and summation, and then that's the end. Okay. So that's actually easy to see. Um, okay. Um, so that first one is easy, and then the second one, right? You want to integrate the absolute value of this one, right? And we just want to show that that's bounded by some bounded by some constant. But um, we're lucky now. We use the we use this this bunch, right? So um, you know, I think that would it could be sort of a pain. But but look, if we look at this, we say, well, look, um, the heat kernel is a sum of, of positive of positive things, right? A positive things. So it's just it's you know you know this is this is. This is some, some positive number, and so we're done already by the first by the first time. Okay. That you know, I, I think that's not completely obvious, right? If, if I gave you this and I said, right, show me that for all x, this is a positive number. Is that obvious? No, it's not obvious, right? Not at all obvious. But thanks to plus summation, it's completely obvious. Obvious in the sense that, <laughs> in the sense that, you know, after a lot of a lot of work, it's, it's obvious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, as you as you as you know already, you know, people toss around terms like obvious or, or trivial uh, very um, very <coughs> recklessly. Uh, clearly, clearly is the is the one you got to watch out for, because clearly usually means that they're trying to hide something. <laughs> yeah, like particularly, yeah, you know, it, it, it's almost it's almost a, a flag that says that the person is hiding something very hard. It is easy to see that. Well, okay. Anyway, um, I guess I say this all the time. Um, okay. So then the last thing, uh, the last thing we need to show is that um, last thing we need to show is that the um, if we take some eta, right, and we look outside of the eta neighborhood of the origin, right, we integrate, so here's, here's one half, and here's negative one half, right, here's negative zero, here's eta, right, we have, we have our, we have our kernel. We're hoping that, you know, for each eta, as t goes down to zero, most of the mass goes inside here. Right? Most, most of the mass goes inside the eta neighborhood. Right, so the mass outside should go to zero. In other words, this should go to zero as t goes down to zero. Right, that's what we want to show. Okay, and so here's the trick. And this is a really, really nice, nice thing to do. Right, you say, well, look. Um, well, um, the heat kernel. We take n equals zero and we get the heat kernel on the line. Right? 
and then we have all the terms for n not equal to zero, right? So n not equal to zero. Right? So we use the Poisson, uh, Poisson summation to say that the heat kernel on the circle is basically the heat kernel on the line plus some error. Okay, and we call it error. So, um, and we know that, we already know that, um, that HP is a good kernel, right? So what we need to do is show that um, we already know that HP is a good kernel, so it suffices to show that, um, that if we take uh, This is the error, right? This this thing is the error, and we're going to claim that um, that e t is controlled by some constant times e to the minus c of t. But this is basically you know you know e to the minus one of t. Okay, and this is actually pretty uh, pretty easy to, to see. If you read the book, and have somebody to show you. Okay, so um, so let's think for a second, right? Um, right. Uh, this ET. Well, I'm just going to replace this by a C. C over root T. Okay. This is the first thing I'm going to. You can see here to, so I don't have to worry about writing for pi, etc. Um, and then here, um, uh, I'm going to say that this thing is bounded by e to the negative uh, cn squared over t. Okay. And you can do this because. Um, because uh, x is small, right? right? So think of what's happening here. Right? You're taking you're taking this n, right? And you're adding some you're adding some small x to it, right? Well, if I um, <coughs> So if I multiply n by some constant, right? So think like this: right? um, n plus x, right? 
right, is between n plus n plus a half and n minus a half, right? And n is not zero, right? So n is one, two, three, four, etc., etc., right? Okay. 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 These are these are my possibilities. These are my possibilities for n, right? So when I add the s onto it, well, it's not going to move that much, right? Okay. Now this thing here is a decreasing function, right? So I multiply my n by say a half. Okay. Something slightly smaller than a half, right? So you notice that um, one half n is less than or equal to um, this n plus x. We're trying to get an upper bound. We're trying to get an upper bound of this guy. This guy is a decreasing function. Right? This guy is a decreasing function. Well, I know the x plus n. The x plus n is bigger than a half n. I am asking you. You got it. So you get the same.
this thing, this thing here, that we bounded it by is smaller than smaller than this thing because of this estimate. Okay? And that allows us to separate separate out the, the one over t, the one over t. Right? So um, <coughs> Right, so what we get then is um, is this thing. So c over t, um, c over root t, e to the negative c over two t. And you pull out the um, you pull out this term, and what we have left is the e to the minus c times square root of two. Maybe it's not obvious. 
But even if t, even if we have that, right? Uh, even if you, you know you're, you're right, Jennifer, right? Because um, it'll, it'll still work, actually. Even if we don't, even if we don't, right? even if we don't have this, yeah. it'll still work because as t goes to zero, right? As t goes to zero, this thing is going to go to zero much faster than the root than the root t. Anyway, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. This thing is going to go. This thing is going to decrease much faster than, than this guy. And so the bound is going to be this thing is is point by bounded by something that goes to zero. The end. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we actually don't have that last bound, but we have the second last. Bound.
I wish I could Spanish. I, I feel the same like every few months. Yeah, because of him and you know other people who who he nurtured. Uh, you know, other. Uh, is 
the generalization of the little, the little data. Um, and for us, significantly, the big data is actually uh, evaluated to my point is the heat kernel on the heat kernel on the, on the system. Interestingly enough. Um, and just to throw something even more tantalizing, um, uh, it turns out that there's this, this relation uh, that if you Then you, then you lose 
you lose your knowledge of the, of the momentum, and vice versa. You can know both of them to some rough extent, but you can't know one of them. Uh, you can't know both of them to an arbitrarily precise extent. Okay, that's pretty bizarre, um, but it's actually um, uh, a result of, of, of Fourier, uh, of, of, uh, which can be is a result that can be shown using Fourier analysis, okay. um, using the Fourier transform. So, um, so in quantum mechanics, and like I said, I don't really know how this, but in quantum mechanics, um, so a uh, particle has associated with it something called a state function. Which we'll do by, by psi. Okay, and this thing is an L2 function uh, norm 1. Um, and this thing basically governs the, uh, the so, so this thing governs the position of the particle. So, um, so we're going to pretend that our, we're in a one dimensional world. Okay. So here's our world. It's only one dimensional. I, I'm assuming that the same sort of thing holds in higher dimensions. But, okay. So, um, so, what does the state function tell you? It tells you that the probability that the particle lies in some interval. Okay, it tells you the probability. That probability is um, is just the integral of the of the, uh, of the absolute value squared over that, over that interval. Okay. Okay. Right. If we integrate over the whole line, of course, we get, we get 1. Right? That's to say that the probability of being in the line is 1, right? which, is, which is as it should be. Right. Okay. And then, um, uh, so this is the problem. This, this, this thing, you know, uh, um, then, if you're thinking about the expected position, well, the expected position uh, denoted by x bar, well, you, you probably can guess how to figure it out. Right? You take the position um, times the probability uh, times the probability that you're going to be in that particular position, right? So this is like an expected value, right? The probability that you're going to be in that position times the position. You take the sum of all those all those expected um, all those expected values, and you get the, the expected position. Okay. So this is the expected um, this is the expected position, and as you probably know, in the same variance, if right, you look at the difference from the expected position. Um, squared. You get the only one of that against the against the problem, against the uh, probability function. So, right. This is measuring, you know, um, how how much how much your function is deviating from the expected position. Right. If your function stays in its its expected position all the time, then the variance is zero. Okay, so here's the cool thing. Um, okay, so one has analogous an analogous uh, setup so, uh, for momentum. Okay, but here's the interesting thing. Um, um, it turns out that the uh, probability of the momentum lying in a B is the integral of the free transform over A B. Okay, so this is the cool thing that this 
state function, the state function governing, governing the momentum is the Fourier transform of the state function governing, governing the position. Okay. And I don't, like I said, I, don't, I have no idea why this is true, but for, for, but for some reason in physics, maybe somebody can tell us, um, uh, the, the, the state function governing the momentum is the Fourier transform of the state function governing, governing the position. So you know that's 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 I don't know what that means. I should I should ask I should ask a physicist to explain. Okay. So um, so here's the Heisenberg principle. Okay. So that the variance of the position. That is the reason that people created these things called labels. Okay. 